I want to welcome you to worship. It still feels like an odd thing to say, welcoming us joining at different times together through different media. But I like to think a welcome is a reminder. A reminder of God's love of you, God's love of me, God's love of us as a church. And our time of worship is us remembering that. So welcome to this time. May God speak to you and speak in your life. And please join us now for worship. We'll be singing It Is Well With My Soul, number 410 in the hymnal. Reading from Habakkuk 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. Let us pray.
God, we come to you again. Acknowledging that this is a tough season, this has been a tough year, and that sometimes we do feel like things are just not getting better. And God, in those moments, help us not to despair. Help us not want to throw our hands up. Help us not want to take our eyes off of you. But help us to be steadfast. Rejoicing in you. Acknowledging that you are God. And that no matter how things look, you are there. God, we pray for guidance. We pray for peace. We pray for hope. We thank you for the good that we see happening around us. And we pray that we would have eyes to see that good, to be encouraged. God, we thank you for this church family. We pray for those who are dealing with ongoing health problems, who are navigating some new health issues, and pray that they would have a strong sense of your presence. God, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that we are united with brothers and sisters around the world in worshiping you. We pray that this time of worship would strengthen us, would prepare us for the week ahead, and that we would leave knowing that we've been in your presence and that that would sustain us in the week ahead. In your son's name we pray. Amen. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentations I hear the real, though far off him that hails a new creation above the tumult and the strife i hear that music ringing it sounds an echo in my soul how can i keep from singing when tyrants tremble sick with fear and hear their death now ringing when friends rejoice both far and near how can i keep from singing in a prison cell and dungeon vile our thoughts to them are winging when friends by shame are undefiled how can i keep from singing what though the darkness round me close i hear the truth it liveth what though the tempest round me roars songs in the night it giveth no storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock i'm clinging since long I keep 
lovers' lamentations. I hear the real, though far off hymn that hails a new. One of my seminary professors told me a story about a time when he was a music minister at a church in New Orleans. One of his faithful choir members would come every Sunday, sing the hymns and songs, but had a habit of dozing off during the sermon. Now, a sleeping choir member might get noticed during a sermon, so my professor in the past went and asked this choir member, what was going on? Why was he falling asleep? He wanted to see what was happening there. He then found out that this choir member worked on a shrimping boat. He would be out all night fishing into the early morning, would finish, deposit his catch, get all cleaned up, and then come to church because he loved singing in the choir. He told this College, the seminary professor, then a music minister, he said, you know, I just am tired and I do my best, but sometimes I doze off. Well, the music, the seminary professor, music minister at the time decided that that was okay. It was fine if he dozed off every once in a while. Because that sweet sleeping choir member was actually a sign of deep faithfulness, of someone coming and doing their best. And, and I love this story and the image it provides because I think it captures an element of church that we don't often talk about. Sometimes in our imaginations we think of church as the lofty, high theology, the beautiful stained glass, the hymns that go through everything, where everything is clean and proper and put together. But church is also, it has those elements, but it's also made up of everyday people. Those who are there in the pews, who might not have the grand lofty things fully on their mind, but also ideas that are mundane. It's the people who are shrimpers, dozing off after a lot of work. The fidgeting kids in the pews. The tired parents next to them. The missed cues during the service. And the everyday people who are just sometimes there, and that's the most they can be. But this is important. Because church, I believe, is a beautiful mix of all of these elements. And in fact, I think church is meant to show that they are not to be apart. No, the holy and lofty mix with the mundane and the everyday in a beautiful way in church. We serve a Lord who preached grand ideas, but was also a homeless man who walked along the dusty road. The Apostle Paul understood this idea. He understood the reality of the everyday and the eternal and divine mixed together in our worship. And I think we see this in the fourth chapter of Philippians as we end our time in Philippians. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 9. And it goes like this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eudodia and I urge Synthike to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. This is a beautiful passage, one that is often quoted and remembered. But I also think if we look at it, it is Paul recognizing the church is made up of the common and the grand, and living our lives means living into both. And and let me explain that. Because in the area of the common, we see that Paul addresses one of those most common everyday elements of conflict and disagreement. They say, there's a saying that the epistles of Paul are like reading someone else's mail. And that's what we're actually doing. These were letters to a church. We are reading Paul's message to a specific body. And in the midst of that, we get glimpses into the life of that church community. The Philippian church was in many ways a model church, one we would want to live up to. And in fact, we see that in the first verse of this passage where Paul is complimenting them. And these are not empty compliments. Throughout this letter, Paul seems to very much convey to the Philippians that they are doing well, that he is proud of them, that they are living out their call. No one's perfect, but they are doing a really good job. And so it might surprise us that even in this church, there was a problem with conflict with disagreement, a disagreement that was serious enough for Paul to address it twice in four chapters. Now, again, this maybe shouldn't surprise us because any family, including a church family, has disagreements and conflict. It's the nature of who we are. And for Paul, this is a big deal because the two women who are in disagreement, Eudodia and Synthache, seem to also be leaders in the church. They have struggled along Paul. They are doing the Lord's work, yet at this point they are not of the same mind. And and we don't know the nature of their disagreement from this text. And this is speculation on my part, but I would venture that this might have been something very serious, something they both saw as very important, because these were two women who truly believed and followed and that Paul uh, followed God who Paul was proud of but even in this agreement when Paul urges them to be of the same mind I don't know if that necessarily means that they need to brush over everything but instead I think Paul is urging them to come together to not let this tear them apart he even urges the rest of the church to help them in this Now, I don't think Paul is giving a blueprint for all church conflict here, but the principles are important of what Paul is saying. There's a concept of caring, of striving to understand, of striving even in disagreement to try to recognize and have the leading of the Lord. The idea that a church can be a place where those in disagreement can work together. Paul calls this church and these two women to a road of loving each other. And in this call, I think Paul recognizes the church is an ordinary place. I remember when I was in high school, my dad got transferred and my family, we moved to England. Now, growing up in Texas, Europe was seen as quite the exotic place. That was where people went on vacations. They saw history and wonderful things. And so my friends would always ask me, and I assumed this was before I moved over what this would be like, they would say, wow, what adventures have you gone on? What things have you seen? And in true, I did get to see some things and go on some trips. But at the same time, there were a lot of stuff that took up most of my days 
It was those aspects of everyday life that were the same in Texas or in London. It was walking the dogs, completing homework, doing chores, helping with the shopping. Those existed in England just like they existed back home in Texas. Europe was not just a vacation spot, but it was also a place where life occurred. In much the same way, the church is definitely a beautiful, hallowed ground. But it is also a group of people living out their faith together. We will encounter everyday problems and even the mundane aspects of every day, of taking out trash, of cleaning the floors, of making everything presentable. And in this church life, we might even have disagreements. But for Paul, the question is not if we, the the concern is not if we have these disagreements, if these mundane aspects come into our life. Instead, it is how we face them. Paul wants to face them with love and striving towards each other and to recognize even in these common elements that our call to Christ comes into them. And in order to do that, he pulls back a step further and pulls our focus a little bit higher. Because for Paul, the life of faith allows us the ability to face the world around us. Worry about nothing, Paul says. In fact, a better translation I like is be anxious of nothing. And and this is a strong statement. Even in our world today, if someone told us be anxious about nothing, that would seem like a tall order. We are facing so much. That seems like a big request. But it was also a big request of the church in Philippi. The Philippians faced a lot of troubles. There were the normal economic and physical hardships of the day, along with the fact that they lived in a city with a government that was not too keen on this new faith they were practicing. They had concerns real concerns and problems. But when Paul asks them to be anxious of nothing, I don't think Paul is saying, pretend like those aren't there. Just wipe over those. No, he wants us to bring these very real concerns to God. And again, this is not acting like there is nothing wrong because we're bringing those thoughts and those requests to God. And Paul thinks that this is really, Paul wants us to see this is really good practical advice. That this draws our thoughts upward. Being anxious means letting the concerns and the worries of the world spin us around like a tire in mud. You know, it's going around a lot, but it's not really gaining any traction. Paul wants us to take these real concerns to God in prayer. And Paul believes prayer can do things. Now, as we know probably through our life of prayer, prayer doesn't always mean that things will be solved in the time frame or in the way that we expect. But Paul does believe that God answers and meets these requests, but also there's something deeper there too. In bringing these requests and giving them to God, we are not just, again, acting like they don't exist, but we're handing over what is beyond our control to someone who cares for us. And the effect of that, as Paul says, is that the peace of God may guard our hearts. The term is almost a garrison standing out front, hearts and minds, and that is a beautiful thing. When I was growing up, I watched a, I think it was a movie produced by Disney called Pollyanna. In the movie, the main character, a young girl named Pollyanna, had a very optimistic view of the world. She would always state everything the best it could be. Now, the movie goes different places, but in popular parlance, a Pollyanna then is someone who is almost naively optimistic. Someone who just is, oh, everything is great even when everything is not. Paul is not asking us to be a Pollyanna. 
But instead, Paul is saying, this anxiousness, these concerns do not need to rule your life. If we can hand them over to God in prayer and can allow God's peace to guard us, that, Paul says, is a much better place to be. Instead of anxiously spinning, we say, God, I, this is beyond my control. I am concerned. Here is my request. Please be with me. And, and so how do we approach the world? I like the saying of one commentator that Paul is asking us to be alert, but not anxious. We're aware of our surroundings. We're aware of the problems. We're aware of what God might call us to do to help. But we're not anxious. We know that God looks after us. And we allow the peace of God to guard our hearts. And, and you can see what Paul is doing. He's talking about the everyday aspects of the world, the things that are real, but he's also bringing us and guiding our eyes up to God. And this is where I think Paul sees this deep connection of the grand and the holy with the everyday. Because let me read again this beautiful verse where Paul says, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. It's beautiful language. Paul is asking us to dwell on these things, dwell on what is good and what is holy. And notice, Paul is not saying that we should ignore the hard parts of the world around us. No, instead, I think he's asking us to focus on what is good. The idea is that dwelling on the good helps us to live into that more. Just anything good, honorable, holy, Paul's saying dwell on those things. I once heard of a coach who, instead of giving negative things, and it's a gymnastic coach, sort of saying, don't break your arms, he'd say, keep your arms straight. He found that just by saying what they should be doing, athletes could focus on that, but when saying don't break your arms or doing that, they were focusing on what they shouldn't. I think in a kind of more complex and a little bit different, but related way, Paul is trying to encourage us to, to focus and dwell on that good, that honorable, that holy. Again, recognize that there is stuff in the world that is not this. But also dwell and focus on those beautiful things. This, I think, again, is that lofty aspect of faith. And it's not meant to condemn us, to tell us, ah, oh, we will never live up to it, but instead to pull us up. In this way, our hymns, our scriptures, our prayers, and our sermons aim to help us dwell on the good in the holy. And hopefully as we do that, little by little as we dwell on that, it allows God to start helping us live into, be that more and more in the world around us transform our minds and to bring goodness and grace and mercy and love into the world around us. This is a challenge for us today. So much of what we read and what we can consume is telling us to dwell on things that are hard. And again, we are not to deny those things. We are to know, be alert of them. But also, we are important to dwell on that goodness, that love, that grace, and to bring it into the world. Finally, I want to end our sermon today with just that one beautiful verse in the middle of this passage, where Paul says, Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. As we seek to live out this calling into the world, one that blends the lofty and divine with the everyday in a beautiful mix, 
that sees the holy in all things, we must not let ourselves gain a big head. We must not lord over or be overly pious to others, but instead, I hope that this call can allow us to see and connect to others in a way of gentleness, of love and care. Imagine that, a church known by its gentleness. I think that would be a great way of showing God's love. Now, when Paul said the Lord is near, we think he might have been talking about his idea of the return of Christ possibly being soon. He did not know, but he suspected. But I also wonder, too, if there's a hint of the idea that in our gentleness and our love, as we are the hands and feet of Christ, we are showing that the Lord Jesus is near. The Lord who lived out the lofty and the everyday and combined them in his life and his actions and calls us to the same. So may we as a church be encouraged and live that out too. Would you pray with me? God, help us be a people who live out your gentleness. We thank you, God, that you have called us to a life that blends the holy and the everyday together. Pray you help us with our anxiousness. Allow us to dwell on what is good. And help us to seek you more. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We'll be singing When Morning Gilds the Skies, number 221 in the hymnal. This week, for as a good word, may I just repeat some of the words of the passage today. May the peace of Christ guard your hearts today and throughout this week. Amen. <laughs>